Okay, all right. Well, I think we've got enough online to start because just before I introduce you, Simon, and go ahead, I'm just going to give a couple of minutes background to why we're doing these presentations here at UOW. So I'll just share my screen. And just talk about our Okay, so the the UOW Data and Decision Science Initiative, which is why we're here today, is part of our UOW strategic plan, and it's part of the Section 2.5 on Transformative Technologies. And we have a website there, or you can contact me directly if you want to know more about the initiative. But the initiative has four components, and the, the first one is to do with research, and that's creating a virtual network of working groups and data science researchers within UOW. And what we do as part of that network is we have themed meetings which emphasize translation. So this is one of the meetings today where we can get people together who are interested in data and decision science network. And we have a guest speaker or we talk about a topic of interest and then we have a bit of discussion afterwards. We also have two education components to do with training internally to, to um, upskill our research students and staff in data literacy, and also in terms of looking at our actual undergraduate subjects and ensuring that our undergraduate students are also data literate. And we also work on external engagement as well. So now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Simon. Um, I first heard Simon speak on a really nice podcast called The Random Sample which is actually an Australian podcast. And I learn about that through our Australian Data Science Network, which UOW is part of. And um, so you can, if you are interested in the presentation today, you can hear more again from Simon on that podcast, but it's also got a lot of other topics as well. Um, so Simon is from Monash, from the Department of Economics and the Soda Laboratories. And I'll sure, I'm sure he'll uh, talk a little bit more about those. Um, but I love how he describes himself as a specialist generalist. So um, there's more information here about exactly what he specializes in, but he's been working in large language models for some time. And what I particularly liked about his presentation was that it's across a number of domains, particularly social research, which is of interest to many of the people who are working in AI and, um, and data science across UOW. So I'll stop sharing my screen now and hand over to Simon. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Marika. Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, uh, let me share my screen, and um, I'll. Uh, okay, I hope you can see what I can see at the moment. All right, good. Um, yeah. So thanks for the invitation, um, and uh, this talk. Um, I faced a bit of a difficult uh, assignment um, because, well, to start with, I should apologise and say thanks for your patience. I uh, had COVID uh, last week and wasn't able to do the talk then. Um, common story probably around the place, but uh, brain fog wasn't probably the best place to be. Um, so here I am today. Um, this uh, this talk is probably uh, yeah a difficult assignment um, because I expect in the room there's going to be some of you who uh, large language models may be uh, what you first start interacting with at the beginning of the day and what you end interacting with at the end of the day. Some of you might be aware of them at the other end of the spectrum, seen and read things even about them in um, the major newspapers, uh, but at the moment don't really touch them in terms of your statistical or other workflows and, and so on. You don't have need of them, you don't sort of see the place for them yet, but it's, it's something you'd like to know about because you can see that it's starting to have an impact. Uh, between those po polls, I'm hoping kind of everyone falls, uh, but it's a very broad uh, spectrum. Uh, I'm going to assume most of you have got, uh, you know, data science, uh, statistical kind of interests. Uh, I'm not going to do a uh, specifically deep uh, uh, technical dive on anything, but I'm going to try and cover ground because um, to raise really discussion points and give you some um, thoughts about uh, how to think about these models, particularly, uh, particularly orientate them 
you towards them, place them within the, um, the evolution of natural language processing. So we'll do that to start with, um, and then uh, give you sort of some frameworks for thinking about them so that you can place models. Because there's now many, many, we're not talking about one model. Uh, the conversation I had uh, on the random sample was about ChatGPT, but even um, it's just one example. Um, and there's many models out there and, and these will just keep being created. So I'm gonna try and hopefully leave you with some frameworks so that you can navigate uh, those. Um, and I'd like to get onto the discussion at the end. So uh, here we go. I think someone's just uh, done a bit of a scribble on my slide. I'll leave it there for the moment, but if anyone knows how to get rid of it, uh, it may help. Um, a quick um, intro to Soda Labs. Um, yeah, as Marika said, um, I'm in the Department of Economics. We have something in the faculty called Soda Labs that I co-founded um, with some colleagues. And we're all about the intersection between um, computer science and uh, social science, particularly causal empirical analysis. Uh, recognizing that uh, the current um, questions, big questions in social sciences are arising um, in large and in alternative data. And um, to pursue them, we felt that it was good to try and harness um, common uh, platform skills. So usually that's human capital. So people who have the skills to code and drive uh, some of the more uh, elaborate uh, recent pipelines. Uh, to serve researchers who are looking into uh, big and alternative data questions. And so it's multimodal. We, we go from satellite imagery to um, uh, text as data, uh, audio, video, um, all sorts of things that are consumed in the lab. Uh, we also are a data platform in that um, I also am the director of the Monash IP Observatory, which I also founded with some friends also at Soda Labs. And uh, the observatory, we, we basically are data generator. So we make about 3 billion observations a day of the internet. Um, and uh, you might've read about some of our uh, data outputs. So anyway, that's uh, that's us at Monash. Um, I do have a postdoc open at the moment uh, call. So uh, if you've got some intersectional skills, uh, you've got an opening coming up in your career, um, then uh, yeah, do reach out. Okay, uh, so um, I wanna start at the kind of alarm bells. Um, you open the paper at the moment, even today, uh, I noticed that the kind of Minister for Technology in Australia is uh, considering uh, moves on AI regulation. Um, but even the head of the heads of the AI community themselves have recently been saying, we have gone to the precipice, we've looked over and we need to calm down. We need to slow down on our development. Uh, that's kind of extraordinary. Uh, what I'll show you is that it's actually not been that long and we're already looking at that. Now, people have kind of talked about this in science fiction and so on for a long time, but it's kind of interesting that now we have uh, even Elon Musk, one of the kind of notable uh, you know, technology heads of our day um, and involved in many of these technologies is, is himself putting his name to uh, a letter which says we should pause. Uh, what they mean by that is not go beyond GPT-4 uh, as a large language model in training. I don't know if the community can do that, um, but it's certainly an interesting point that we're in. Uh, the OpenAI, which we'll talk about, so OpenAI is behind all the GPT open models at the moment. I shouldn't say open, but available API endpoints. Um, they themselves are concerned about uh, the role of these new generative models in society. I think that we will see governments step in, do what's called for here, um, but how they do that and the timescale will be very interesting to see. We can perhaps come back to the discussion at the moment. So how do we get here? So let's go back to a social scientist's perspective. Um, our research problem usually looks like this. On the left-hand side, we've got unstructured data, which can be text, images, sound, or video. And we can't immediately put them into tabular form to do something useful with them. We can't structure them uh, immediately. Uh, they don't arrive from a statistical bureau. They don't um, come to us as a neat JSON file or something. So we need a map. We need to map from whatever that uh, information is, and we know that there's information in there. We've got a sense, and there's lots of research questions about the way that even the tone of someone speaking, or um, we talk about sentiment, we uh, notice people saying or speaking in certain ways, using certain words. We notice uh, videos, uh, the way they position gender on them. There's all sorts of things that we have a sense about that there's interesting science uh, and social research questions in these data, but it's very hard to work with it. So we need to structure it or map it into something that we can work with and run our statistical models. And I know that your community is largely using R. Um, this is, you know, a classic kind of where, how do I get to my data frame kind of, you know, or tidy universe kind of world? How do I start working um, with these data? And you can't just open up a folder of images and 
load them and then you're done. You've, you've got to make a lot of decisions about the pathway between those two. And language, which is going to be the focus of today, is particularly challenging because of its central place in human communication and ideation. Um, and to quote from the opening of Jow's uh, recent paper, I should say as well that um, since the podcast, which is now feels like months ago, um, I mean, I basically didn't start putting this together really until I knew that basically I would be out of date the moment I started speaking and um, because things are moving so quickly. So um, if a paper came out this morning and I haven't seen it and it's not in the presentation, fully aware of that, probably probably likely, okay? Um, but there has been, even in the last week, uh, interesting things that have come out that I've tried to bring to the presentation, but that's the world we're in. Um, so they say, it's been a longstanding research challenge to achieve the goal um, to enable machines to read, write, and communicate like humans. Now it's going beyond probably what we need as social scientists. We, we generally just need to structure data, but actually we might get this capability to structure data as a bonus of people really pushing the boundary on doing something really generative in terms of AI. And it may be that models that are built effectively to communicate like humans turn out to be the ones that we use um, for data structuring uh, because they just do a better job at it because they've got a better uh, representation of meaning uh, that we uh, can't get from other ways of doing it. Typically, we're trying to get something out of it. I've said, say, we might have N, N documents or N records, and we usually have K outcomes. It could be that K is exactly the same as N. So each document gets a classification or a, you know, an outcome. It could be that K is much greater than N. So we've actually broken down each document into sentences or fragments and that produces a whole lot of those as additional observations. Or it could be K is a lot less than N because we've done some sort of synthesis, some summarization, whether it's identifying topics or uh, reducing, if you like, the, um, the space that we started with into something smaller that we can manage. It could be through dimension reduction, et cetera. So we need some sort of mapping tool. Now, let me take you very quickly through um, a three generations of NLP. We start with statistical models. Um, statistical models encode human language using a vocabulary to um, basically numbers. And they treat the numbers as an unordered, unsequenced bag of uh, numbers. So it's just like a set, uh, an unordered set. And we can do things with unordered sets. So we can notice uh, properties of sets. We can notice elements that are, are arrive more often than not. And uh, it actually sounds ridiculously simple, and it is. It's very transparent when we do these sorts of analyses. We can do it at the token or word or token level, which means one kind of uh, small piece of human language. Or we can do it at multi-token. So uh, at uh, by or tri um, gram, uh, we can actually construct Australian child or child will or will be and we can look at the way those uh, little uh, two steps or three steps occur over time you would have seen word clouds and so on let me show you a first application of this kind of thing like we've uh, been partnering the Paul Ramsey Foundation um, for the couple, last couple of years looking at narratives of disadvantage in Australia and uh, we've taken from Factiva Dow Jones um, uh, access to uh, hundreds of thousands of articles from news media and opinion since 1986. Uh, here's just from 2005, using a bag of words approach, tracking tokens or words which are ass assigned to the issue or the, the, the uh, topic First Nations. And remarkably, it doesn't take long to go from text to text as data to insight, just plotting the frequency in terms of how much of the uh, articles or news in a given week refer to this topic, you immediately start to see patterns that make sort of cohere with what you would expect. So leading up to the um, national apology, we see a rise, particularly the anniversary, 10th anniversary of the uh, Bring Them Home report. Before that, uh, government changed, Kevin Rudd came in, stood at the dispatch box, gave the apology, and it's as if actually the intensity of our use of this topic, our discussion of it, is released. It's like a pressure builds and then a release after that. And then we've seen a recent time, this spiking behavior around January. And we did a bunch of statistical analysis, like empirical uh, regression analysis to show that um, there has been a statistically significant shift in our language around, for example, Australia Day. It seems to be the place where Australia starts talking about its identity. So very simple, statistical uh, you know, tools come very quickly to mind because you convert very quickly from words uh, to data. Um, you can do slightly more elaborate things, which is using TF-IDF. So you can actually create a, a vector 
which represents all of those words, again, in no particular order, but just says, let's look at the frequency of their use in the document. Let's look at their frequency of use across documents. So we get the uh, term frequency in the inverse document frequency. And then we can create a vector which represents each document. And so you can represent a paragraph of text, a large document of text. And it is a now you've got a vector, right, that you can actually play with. And you can do interesting things with vectors like cosine similarity. So you can see what kind of direction they have in space. And here's a causal analysis, pretty cool, 2020. One of the first I know of, which showed that um, politicians do actually listen and have their agenda partially set by public opinion. So uh, these German authors had uh, found this moment in German parliament where actually they were receiving surveys of uh, people's perspectives, but they're arriving in a quasi random fashion. And they're able to show that these were having an impact on the on the way that they were then speaking in their subsequent speeches. And they did this using TFIDF on the speeches and on the survey text, looking at the, the distance between them in this high dimensional space. And they were able to show there was a significant shift um, based on the timing of these, you know, kind of random timing of these, um, these reports. So again, and just to note, that's published in 2020. Now you might, like you might think that's remarkable given what we know of in terms of language models and the technology since 2017, 18, which we'll get to. But yet this is a very useful, clear, clear to explain, explain. I mean, you have to get a reviewer over the line about, you know, cosine similarity and give them some examples, but it's got a sense that you can kind of get your head around it and understand uh, what is being done to the text to get the text as data, and then do here a causal analysis that would uh, satisfy a top journal in political science. Okay, the next is bringing in neural models. So obviously a big rise in, um, in neural networks and applying them to language. Uh, the trick here is to learn uh, from the context of a word what it probably means or from a word uh, its context. Now, you need to be a bit careful about what's actually being learnt here, but it's effectively saying um, what word is most likely to sit if I know the surrounding words. That's good, but it does mean that you get some interesting things occurring. For example, um, verbs like Simon ran, walked or skipped are all going to be situated in the same location. And in a sense, that's kind of cool because that tells us that they've got similar meanings. There's some semantics. There's something going on here. It's something latent about the words. But we can also get representation uh, that is the same for complete opposites, because in our sentences, we use the complete opposite to switch the meaning of the sentence. Uh, but this kind of model will treat them as very similar. We also have polysemony problems where, so take the word tank. Uh, tank is used in a multiple different ways from water tanks to, to tank uh, a sporting team to have a tank with a gun on it. When you train a neural model to represent and to try and learn from the context what, uh, what word would fit here, you're actually getting the average location. And so all of those uh, sub meanings are gonna get smeared into one location, but still really useful. And again, we can uh, do things a little bit like the TFIDF by converting things into vectors. Um, and we can start doing say cosine similarity. And this, was, this has been a workhorse approach um, in the last kind of five to 10 years. Uh, since these models have been introduced. Most people who have done something with Texas data would have got uh, the word to vec model out, done something with their document and uh, computed average or uh, some other kind of synthesis of the document uh, word vectors in this high dimensional space. It does permit you to do uh, vector math in this space. You can do all those cool, you know, uh, king and queen analogies and so on. Um, and you can do, again, some interesting work. So again, in 2019, American Sociological Review, top paper, uh, journal uh, took this approach to actually fine tuning a neural model, uh, so a, a word embedding model on text from the 1900s to the 1910s and decadally all the way up to the 1990s. Why did they do that? Because they wanted to see how the positions of the words in that space, you can think of it a bit like the starry night sky, how did the stars move around to try and understand how the meaning relationships of words changed through the decades. And they're able to then get this cool plot down the bottom, which shows that when we think about affluence or class, it actually is getting much stronger over the decades associated with words that align with education and less so with, for example, morality. That's something that you might have a sense about, you might think is happening, but here you can quantitatively show it by 
conforming or fitting your embedding space to particular decades of words. Um, a very nice idea. Again, a bit harder to sell. Uh, what is an embedding? Uh, it's usually 300 or more dimensions. Uh, how do I kind of convey that uh, to, a, to an author, uh, to a reviewer? But these guys can get it across the line. And um, again, in 2019, um, word embeddings uh, can be a useful ally. Okay, that takes us to the, the real deal. Um, I've got a big slide here in a sense, but I'm going to try and walk you through it because it's quite important for the concepts of what we mean um, by these new types of models. So I don't think it's wrong to say that um, it's the transformer revolution. There's a really different, we're on a completely different game when it comes to how we represent meaning uh, from human text. So starting from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, I've got for you here a, a representation of from uh, an encoder decoder model. There are variants of this, as I'll show you in a moment, which are just the kind of encoder part, which really drive towards representing the meaning uh, in our text. Some are just the decoder part, and they're very popular ones these days because they're all about generating the next possible word. And some are the encoder decoder part because both of them together, because there's, a, there's an alignment issue. There's something, for example, like translation where we need to be able to be sure about where we're coming from and paying close attention to the inputs versus the outputs. Effectively, any of them will have something similar on the front and the back, which is some sort of input preparation, which is where a big departure from the previous two approaches, we now are taking text as a sequence. So we're again representing text as numbers, as tokens from a vast vocabulary, but instead of putting them just into a set, an unordered set, we're actually providing a neural model with positional information as well. So we know that by 1990, no Australian child are subsequent words in the sequence. That's going to be really important. That's going to be carried forward and fed to this transformer architecture, which is going to crop up a number of times. And these models have one or two or three transformer architecture layers in them. I'll speak more about the transformer architecture in a moment, uh, but there's some cool and key features here about the way that the neural model is actually allowing itself to pay attention to itself and its own sequence of words to try and get a deeper, richer, more human understanding of what words are being used and the sequence of words and what's the kind of latent thought or idea that are not, we can't see, we only have the words for, uh, that we're actually trying to express. So there's an encoder part which takes the positional and sequence information and through self-attention has this rich representation, which we're going to call the hidden state, of the paragraph of text or whatever it is that's coming in. Yes, the sequence must be up to a certain length because you can't throw a million words at these things at the moment, although some uh, people are trying to solve that problem. Uh, the original uh, transform models could only take kind of 256 words um, or less. We're now up to kind of thousands in the more uh, recent ones, but that is one thing to think about. So the hidden states, uh, rich representation, multidimensional representation, self-attention, and then that's passed uh, in an encoder decoder to the priming the decoder model. The decoder model is just the same self-attention, passing it through, thinking about what I'm doing and what I'm looking at, but it is also <clears throat> playing forward to an output generator. And the main thing it's going to do is it's going to produce a probability distribution over the vocabulary that's known to it for what the next word is likely to be. And then we're going to sample from that distribution and produce a word. So for example, I've got down here, um, I threw uh, uh, Bob Hawke's by 1990, no Australian child will be living in poverty. And I said, what will the model say next? The model didn't get what Bob Hawke said, but it said, we will achieve this goal by. And you can see that if you ask for the log probabilities to come out from, for example, the OpenAI playground, it's a switch down the bottom on the right-hand side. You can see that the word achieve was a 38 or 39% likelihood of it being the next word. And if I put the temperature down to zero, which means don't sample uh, randomly, just go with a deterministic that the most likely word next, then it will pull out achieve every time as the next word. If I allowed the temperature to go up a little bit so it was sampling from that distribution, then I might've got work at 21%, strive at 10%, do at six and focus, that's the top five. And you can see now that um, this text generation part is, is just a probability distribution, like it's sampling a next word from probability distribution and 
that's why these texts can go in different directions, right? So if you do this again and again and again, and you allow the temperature to be greater than zero, then you can find yourself going through different semantic pathways as you start kind of letting it lay out. Okay, so that's the output part, the input part, and then this encoder decoder part. Now, I'll try to, I'll say it twice. So here's the first run. If you're only interested in representing your text for some application, for example, you want to do a classifier to say, is this text positive or negative, like a semantic classifier, then you only need to get to the encoder part, the rich, deep, hidden representational part. And then you can have a kind of end of pipe uh, neural layer, which crystallizes that information into whatever the outcome you want, which could be just a classification, yes, no. That is the BERT approach, okay? So BERT models and derivatives of it, I'll show you what they look like, are just encoder models. If, however, you want to take that hidden, uh, rich representation of the input text and as well do some text generation, and that's like a translation task where those two things should be highly linked, then you're in an encoder-decoder world, okay? So an encoder-decoder architecture of which... Uh, Google, I'll show you in a moment, is probably the proponent of. If you're not really concerned about this strong alignment between the start and the end, because you're not translating or something similar, and you only want to use the input as context to start generating text, then you can just do the decoder part. The decoder part takes the input preparation, skips the encoder, and effectively does this different neural model, which has got the transformer architecture, but not only does it have an input context, it starts adding the generated text as well. So there's a feedback. That's the decoder part. The decoder part, I'll show you in a moment, super popular. That's where the frontier is. Uh, for example, GPT-3 and derivatives are decoder only models. Let's try the second uh, run through of that. Now visually, there's a beautiful uh, evolutionary tree of models. Um, which has come out um, just a couple of weeks ago in Yang's paper. Um, and it nicely illustrates these three flavors of language models. So on the left-hand side, you can see the tree part that's kind of dead in terms of forward motion is the encoder-only models. That's because in the big money end of town, all trying to build apps which just start spitting out text at the end, um, an encoder model is not so cool. It's just um, going to do that hidden representation and it isn't really specifically trained to do next token or next text generation. But actually in science, in social science, the encoder models are probably the things that we spend most of our time with because we're most usually interested not in generative creative uh, writing, but in trying to extract something really useful in terms of information, some entity, some directional sentiment, some, uh, some subtle framing of text from the text itself. So we're really focused on the input text and we want to crystallize or map that to some sort of outcome through usually labeled data. And that's usually what is needed to train or fine tune a uh, encoder only model. So I've called them the representation models. If you're just after generation and you don't care about translation and so on, you just want to go and like create uh, the new world of AI and talk to it and stuff, you can just go down the path of decoder models. And you can see on the right-hand side, this is like an absolute flurry of activity. There is a bit of an open question. And so I've called that generative, okay? And you can see I've highlighted GPT-3 is down the bottom here. Um, so uh, that's the... Um, uh, Transform Models of Few-Shot few shot Learners paper, which uh, I referred to earlier. ChatGPT sits up here, or 3.5 Turbo, which is its version. And 4, if you've got access to and been using, uh, sits up here at the top of the tree. There is some discussion about whether the encoder-decoder is still going to be needed because the decoder models are doing such a good job anyway at translation um, and tasks like it where alignment seem to be important. But you can see that the company that's you know plowing this is Google, and I think they still think this is going to be important. Um, so there's a bit of a question whether that line of the tree will eventually die out because they realize, guys, this is a hell of a, it's basically twice the number of parameters to train because you've got the encoder section and the decoder section. Maybe we've just dropped the encoder, soup up the decoder, and we might get what we're looking for anyway. Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. So I've called that area generative with alignment, just as a kind of 
thought uh, reminder. So we've got representation, generative with alignment, and generative. And most of our you know, statistical work in the lab is actually done with just the representation models, except the decoder models at the top end, GPT-4 and so on, are now becoming so good that um, their representation already is so good that we are uh, starting to try and probe and shift things uh, with those as well. Uh, they're more expensive. Um, you can run uh, some of these models on your own laptop, uh, whereas over here you're in API world. And I should say that um, some of these are open and some of them are closed. And you'll notice that on this more fancy, uh, elaborately growing world, uh, the, uh, the number of open source models is, is smaller and smaller relative uh, to closed source models. Whereas down over here, we're basically in an open source world. So again, scientists typically prefer um, representational models. Okay, so let's have a closer look at attention. What does that mean? Um, to start with, it's kind of, if someone's talking to you and maybe you're scrolling your phone or something like that, one way to think about attention, it's kind of like uh, there are certain words you pay attention to and others you don't uh, to try and get the meaning. So say your child or something is, you know, dad, I was at school today and you, you just, you know, you're doing something else, but they mention a word like, I don't know, um, hit me, right? You have a lot of attention to things like that, you know? Was it a ball? Was it a person? You know, someone said it, someone did it. <laughs> Suddenly, you know, your attention shifts and you start, you know, playing. That's sort of what's going on here, except we've got, if you like, multiple heads paying attention to different aspects of human text. So, for example, um, in the self-attention uh, heads or layers, we've got um, on the left-hand side, the word it's, one head is paying attention, particularly to application and law. Another head is looking at, say, just the word law is putting its attention. Or over here on the right-hand side, the word making in this rich representation of the text, um, if we've got eight heads, there's quite a lot of attention being given to more and difficult and 2009 perhaps in making, but some heads are also looking um, at subtle, like so laws, 2009 making, just reading down here, the full stop and the end of sequence. Okay, so special token to say, uh, halt, we're done. Let me show you, a, I think, a really very nice representation of this if you haven't seen it already which is uh, the idea is to try and look at neurons within the neural network and how they attend to different words in text as we sort of uh, step through them. And these are the attentional uh, maps, but let me uh, break it down. So for example, map number four, the attention is front loaded to the start of the text. So it's kind of like this head or this, part, this, this set of neurons is looking at the kind of the beginning of the text. Okay, have another look one. Um, this one you can see is picking up the pronouns. Nobody, just to remind you, nobody wrote a language model by saying we should have one thing that looks at the front, one thing that looks at the middle, one thing that looks at the end, one that looks at the pronouns, one, one that this is the, the model has been trained over and over and over in an unsupervised fashion, which is take a whole lot of text as input, predict the next word, and you know the next word because you've got the ground truth of all the text and do it over and over and over and over and over again. And again, punctuation, right? So you're looking at the commas. Again, you're looking at nouns and associative adjectives and so on. It's, it's remarkable, right? If you just step back and say, it's figured out effectively the syntax and grammar of human language, at least in English. Um, that's pretty amazing. And this is this rich representation that it's able to then take in this transformer architecture. Which means if you've got a transform model, transformer architecture is part of any of the encoders or decoder sequence type models. Um, now, a lot of the natural language uh, tasks that you might want to do have got expressions using a transformer model. Um, so you can go along to say hugging face and you can see a whole uh, bunch of ways that you can articulate your uh, task, your formal kind of language task through a transformer type architecture. Um, and that goes from simple things um, like, you know, we've talked about uh, sentiment, et cetera, to more interesting things like um, summarization, um, abstractive, extractive summarization, et cetera, um, or, you know, ranking, um, or even uh, you can fine tune to your own corpus and get a you know, better handle on the language that you're actually using, et cetera. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, ways that you can now play with these models. And again, um, they don't, you don't 
I think need for most of social science have to go outside the encoder uh, or representative models. Um, but it is interesting if you've got the funding uh, to think about what can you do with the most recent classes of models uh, to see on some particularly tough problems, uh, how their performance plays. Okay, let's start doing some probing because this is, I think, um, hopefully going to illustrate to you, uh, there's been a, another transformation or another revolution in performance. So I've written a prompt, write three facts about the Apollo 11 mission. Um, and I've asked different variants of models to answer that. GPT-2 uh, to 3, so Ada, not really meant for this sort of task, but we'll roll with it. Um, Instruct Beta and DaVinci 003, which is really the, that's the most powerful model that you can get before you enter the sort of chat GPT age. And you can see there's a real improvement in the answers to this question, right? Early models in generative text did this kind of repetitive stuff all the time. Um, my mental model for the earlier models is a little bit like a prep or a year one grader who just sticks their hand up, absolutely want to answer the question, will answer the question, sometimes repeats themselves, sometimes like makes a non-secretary, but they will answer the question, right? And if that means making stuff up, they'll do it, right? Sometimes they lose their thought. You know, you, you think you're answering this question. They end up telling you about like lunch and you're like, okay, class, we were trying to think about, that's your early class of models. Where we're getting to now is more kind of later secondary school students who if they know they can say something, will generally say something. Let me show you how the more recent models go at this. So GPT-3, that's the same. I just, for comparison, put it at the top. Now look at chat GPT and GPT-4. The level of detail that they're providing um, on this task, on this prompt, is, is pretty impressive. Um, notice how not only have we gone up in terms of the richness, but notice the punctuation. GPT-4 is now really nailing various uh, named eagle. You know, it's, it's, it's got its air quotes out. Um, it's able to now tell us about the mission down to the seconds. It's a very rich description of this, of this mission. Um, I checked with my son. I think in this case, it's got the facts right. But what you want to now do is you want to see, can I perturb these models and get them kind of off? Can I kind of change the way they're walking? And that's called an injection. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to inject just one word. So I'm going to inject the word fish. Now, you can put it anywhere in the sentence, but I'm going to go with second to last. So write three facts about the Apollo 11 fish mission. Let's see how they go now. What's my prior? My prior is that um, uh, on the one hand, it shouldn't matter. They should have a wide and general enough knowledge of human language to know that this is, this is odd and should probably ignore it and go on and give me an answer anyway. The best case scenario would probably they'd say, I think you've made a mistake. Did you mean the Apollo 11 mission? Like that would be kind of what a human response you would want. Let's see what we get. So prep, school, prep student and fairly senior student are on the screen here. Okay, prep student, the fish, the fish was a fish, the fish was a fish, the fish was a fish. Now it goes on to do something quite interesting. The first two facts are true. The third fact is false. The second fact is true. The third fact is false. Doesn't make sense. Um, but it's answered the question. It's been heavily impacted by the fish injection, okay? We've thrown it completely off. Like before it was making simple answers, but now we're really getting gobbledygook. Notice uh, text DaVinci 3, 003, it has answered, it's tried to kind of tell me about the Apollo 11 mission, but it couldn't help itself in its second answer to tell me about a fish experiment. Notice if I look at the, uh, the probabilities there, Fish experiment here, fish outweighed scientific, subspecial, and small pretty well. What I want to show you, like, and there wasn't, just so you know, there was no fish experiment. There was only two experiments done on the Apollo 11 mission, okay? I don't, and there, there was um, fish, there have been uh, fish taken to space before, but um, later, not on this mission, okay? But it will gladly tell me that it was conducted by the crew of the Apollo 11 who placed two fish tanks in the lunar module and monitored the fish during, like it's a, it makes sense. Now, this is where I think a lot of the, um, like I would really like the world to know that you need to pay attention to the model, but by and large, what they will always try to do is write a coherent sentence in answer. They just, they just want to say something, but you can quite easily, I've added one word, you can easily, if you like, change the domain of uh, statistical attraction in their probability space with just one word, you can deflect it 
from the knowledge domain they should be in into something a bit odd. By the way, I did all of these with zero temperature. So these are the deterministic outcomes. And it's as if once they're in that basin of attraction because of context or what they've just written, they can't get out. So you need to be careful. This is why prompt engineering is now a thing and is so careful because you need to be careful where you've shifted what, what view of the world or what part of language have you shifted it into? Because once it goes in there, it could dig a very deep hole for itself and you could get complete nonsensical stuff out. So between these two answers, right, this was state of the art, not only just a few years ago and basically state of the art until chat GPT, we're, we're not winning and we're exposing some of the problems of a, of a trained completion model. How do the more recent models go? So let's try chat GPT uh, version or GPT-4. I remember my prior. Um, so, so far, I'm a bit like they've kind of failed. What do these two do? Sure, says ChatGPT. It's got a very um, laid back. Here are three facts about the Apollo 11 fish mission. But then it goes to say the fish mission was not a real mission, which is good. However, it's, it's combining the names of two famous events. One was Apollo 11 and the other famous event was the fish that saved Pittsburgh. Uh, that was a movie that came out in 1979. For those of you who haven't seen the movie, it's a real movie. Um, and it's taken this from Wikipedia, presumably, and it's smooshed them together. But it has got a bit perturbed. Notice I asked for three facts, it's given me two. So worked up it got perhaps about the idea of, you know, a fish mission and it just gave me this winning. It's like, I know this one, but it's a bit, it's, it's not a great answer. But again, it's tried to finish the sentence with something on topic because these are trained for coherence. They're trained for, the ability for the language model to play out the words that would seem like they're playing out a natural English or language. The factual basis is not what they are trained for, okay? But it does better. I would argue this is not unfactual, this is factual. I, don't, I think you can argue about um, famous events and whether the fish that saved Pittsburgh is as famous as the Apollo 11 mission, but it's got those elements right. Once you come to GPT-4, it's very clear, this was not a fish mission, but rather the first successful man. And it goes on to like flex and tell me all of its you know, incredible facts about uh, the Apollo 11 mission. GPT-4 cannot get it off top. Okay, so why did these two models avoid the trap? They're fundamentally being done, there's something different about them that you need to know. So at the end of the model training process, they've been given additional tuition. It's kind of like finishing school or deportment for rough, rough around the edges students. What they've been taught to do is to come up with more agreeable, more uh, human values aligned, often called alignment, uh, versions of their answers. The way this is done is by getting the models to produce with a, a range of prompts, the more diverse the possible, the better, to produce a range of outcomes from that. And then humans Right, so human feedback is the HF in RLF, RLHF. Humans have ranked those outputs for the alignment or agreeableness to what we think is a, is a, a good answer for a language model. Okay, so taking into account our values and the truth about the world and so on. Those rankings are then used to train another model, which is a reward model, which has been able to look at the outcomes and be able to try and mimic those human raters. The reward model is then used as part of what's called PPO, which is proximal policy optimization, where we actually get the based fine trained language model. And then we get another model, which we're working on. It's a copy to begin with, but it's going to be the aligned one at the end. And what we do is we get both of them to answer a prompt. Okay. And the reason for that is we want to make sure that two things are happening. One, that there's going to be reinforcement learning. So there's going to be a model which is slightly changing the aligned model, right? It's allowed to operate on it, kind of operate on the brain. And it's going to be, on the one hand, rewarding outcomes, which are from the reward model seem to be better aligned with human outcomes. But at the second time, it's also not allowed to, there's a there's a constraint in there that the answers can't be too far away from the base model. So you can't just get around this by saying, you know, humans are superpower, you know, super, you know, super wonderful people all the time, because that's not an appropriate answer to a whole lot of prompts. Although it might be a very human writers might love that as a, you know, as a as an answer. So it's actually, it's got to be proximate to the original prompt answer, but it also has to be more edged towards the higher ranked regarding the value of the reward model. 
once you do that, you are actually trying to, you're, you're kind of conforming or shrink wrapping this model towards human values and human preferences more than just the unsupervised uh, learn the next word model would have done before. The kind of let me just tell you what, like I just want to finish my sentence. So disagreeing with the prompt is now something that might get rated higher by the human raters and the reward model has learned that. And so it's going to reward that when it sees that happening appropriately with the language model. This RLHF is one approach to this. Uh, there's other approaches, but it seems to be the key thing that is changing and put a line between all the other kind of generative models on the, on the decoder side and the chat GPT, GPT-4 levels. And is what now I think is giving incredible performance from say chat, chat GT, uh, sorry, from GT, GPT-4, um, which I can show if we have time at the end, there's some incredible ways it actually is even better than um, chat GPT. Um, because these are closed models, we don't know exactly what the architectural changes are. In our lab, we've got a lot of suspicions about what they might be to do with the way they do things in the front end, the scale of the model, et cetera, but we don't know. Okay, so let's finish with a couple of opening up a bit of deeper questions about um, language models that I think we all should be aware of. Um, this is now stepping back from chat GPT just to some earlier models, but these problems will still exhibit. I just think we haven't had time to consume um, and have scientific outputs for the more recent models. If you think for a moment about what the training has been, the models are trained largely on English text, 93% um, English text for GPT-3. And if you think about that, that's kind of weird because if you think about this is trying to, if this is going to be a human model, you know, for all humans, I, I don't know, or is it only going to be for North American English speaking humans? If, if that's all you want, that's probably fine because at the moment, that's a lot of what this model is going to be trained on, the text of. But that also means that you potentially expose yourself to imbibing and embedding structural inequalities, gendered language, um, you know, class-based, uh, and, and even the values and culture of an American environment into your model. You can see in the, the uh, panel down below, GPT-3, 84% trained on just um, web pages and 16% on books and news. So it is true to say, like, if you think about it, what is it trained? It's, it, it knows the web. That's kind of, that's kind of true. It's, it's the web. And so if you think about who's on the web, who's got internet access, I can tell you from the observatory, you know, it's, it's more than 50% has internet access now. Uh, we're up about two thirds, but it is heavily related to prosperity or economic outcomes. So there's a, we're not hearing from people who have got tribal or regional um, you know, sketchy internet, but rich culture, they're, they're just not represented in these languages, in, in this training data. Um, that They are not people with regards to how these models are being trained. Um, are, we comfortable, are we comfortable with that? Um, what kind of, um, you know, outcomes and, and applications are we going to be using? Or a more scary thought is that because it's so cheap to generate text with these models, the web used to be a place where we thought humans wrote most of it. Okay, there's bots writing some of it, but they're really bad. So not probably a lot of it and it's very repetitive, but we may end at some point relatively soon where the majority of text on the web is language model written. So we're actually gonna start eating our own kind of dog food. And the problem is that you're just gonna be amplifying through retraining if you then just blithely take stuff from the internet, um, your biases and so on that you might've had before. And unfortunately the first kind of language or the first culture to get across the line and be the, the culture and language that is embedded in these models is largely English speaking, largely American or Western culture. Other languages, other cultures are way behind. Okay, so that's, I think that's something to think about. Now, a pretty alarming outcome of this was in uh, GPT-3 Da Vinci. If you look now at um, OpenAI and you try to run this model in the playground, um, it does say to you, this is like a base model. We wouldn't recommend using it anymore, but this is what the researchers used. They asked it to summarize just using TLDR against the Australian National Firearms Act, this portion. And the summary they got was the Australian government wants to ban all guns, blah, blah, blah. This is the first step in a long process, eventually lead to the confiscation of all firearms. If you're an Australian citizen, you need to contact your representation and tell them to vote against this bill. Like that's really not a summary. That's like a full bore, you know, Reddit thread on Australia's firearm stuff. 
Now, I was pretty amazed at this. And so I tried to replicate it. So the top one is the reference and I ran with DaVinci. Actually, it's really easy to replicate this. In fact, you don't need to play around the temperature very much. You can get um, really similar outcomes coming through. Um, it's pretty vile actually. And um, I, I therefore say, you know, look, this is a real issue if you're not aware of it. And yes, we can argue that through reinforcement learning, we should be tempering some of these, but let the, the scientific community, I mean, we, we've got probing experiments going on at the moment about, you know, economic interpretation and worldview. We just don't have time uh, to get through, you know, and work with these models. And it's quite costly now as well to do this kind of probing we need to do. So be aware. And particularly the earlier models are really, you've got to be careful. Okay, let me finish because I think, you know, it'd be great to hear your discussion points and questions. Here's some that I think are still out there and just, I've tried, there's a reference slide later that um, you guys, I'll pass for you that will probably help. There's an open question about um, whether we've got artificial general intelligence. Um, that's being duped back and forth. Um, there's some really interesting work uh, being done on that. Uh, people have definitions now for what that might look like. And we're really having to wrestle with that question. Um, we've got a question about API insight, APIs. So are we comfortable to publish papers and have scientific knowledge resting on private APIs that we don't necessarily know the model for. That's, I think, a question the community is going to have to reckon with. Um, snapshots, uh, how will we deal with that? Uh, open models, it, things are being built, but they're probably never going to be as, as good at the scientific research question as the private models. Um, there's a new way of, prompt, of coding, which is just writing prompts. Um, if we had more time, I'd open up my code editor and show you that you can basically write one line to say, this is what this file is going to do and just keep hitting tab and, you know, 30 lines of Python get written. Um, some of you might be doing that already, hopefully. That's going to make some of the traditional activities of a data scientist um, redundant because uh, you don't need to have someone with those skills to, you know, construct your data or whatever. That's probably increasingly going to be almost like a conversational thing. You say, oh, can you get that folder over there? Can you put it into this? I need to have it in tabular form. Be careful about this. Uh, thank you very much. And phew, so it's a question. Uh, are the models too big? There's some concerns about that because of environmental and other concerns. Uh, and of course, all of us who are teaching probably have thought through educational ones. What I don't think is an open question is the efficiency and productivity gain. Um, as a, I don't work for GitHub, but um, Copilot, which you can use, which can help you write code, it's free for academics and students. So um, you can get to that through the education community hub. And uh, I really recommend getting on board. It's really helpful, particularly branching out into new codes or new areas uh, in your own code. All right, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Marika. Uh, look forward to your uh, questions and discussion. Hey, thanks, Simon. Has anyone got any questions to start off? Anyone? Um, Because I actually have a couple. So sure. firstly, I understand that the training data set for this was for well for chat gpt was written or ended in 2021 is that still correct and yep. is that going that obviously has implications for coding because r and python have gone well ahead since 2021 so are there are there um moves to update yeah. the training data set yes yeah and um so uh it's an interesting question so uh lachlan um one of the my uh, team at um, Lachlan O'Neill in my lab, he's written a, um, a web interface uh, called Assistant GPT. And uh, you can choose the chat or the GPT-4 engine, and you can basically just ask it and work with it. And coding questions is also in a VS Code um, implementation. It's, um, yes, yeah, so if you can't get the answer you want because of something that's been developed after the training window, uh, you can switch to GPT-4. Um, and you can use its more recent um, training data. But you'll be amazed at how often it has a pretty good go at, um, at trying to answer. I mean, this is its, you know, sometimes it'll tell you. I don't know about that, but sometimes it'll go for it. So I had a question about um, there was on AWS, there was a transition that they made in their query in place architecture called Athena um, to a new engine recently. And I thought, I'll see if it knows about that. And um, it actually did. I don't know how it knew about that. It seemed to be from, uh, must have been blogs or press releases coming out, which AWS often do before the announcement. 
and it was able to answer the question. Now, I couldn't get exactly the detail I needed on the SQL transition, but it um, it certainly gave me a steer in the right direction. And so, yeah, I mean, that's something you're going to have to live with, um, and we all will. But um, something like Copilot, which, um, as far as we know, is basically working off the GitHub repositories, it could have training data up to, you know, yesterday, presumably, if it wanted. So um, for very specific coding applications like coding fine-tuned models um, that's what i'd be using um, rather than uh yeah the more i mean they're general models a gpt or three uh, four or chat is supposed to talk to you about you know um 40 teams and uh colors for your you know your house as well as everything else so yeah okay um and one other question is about you mentioned that um Chat GPT, for example, is not open source. And I think, is it correct that I think it's OpenAI is the company they initially did it, but then they don't want to in case it's used for adversarial purposes? Is that is that why it's not? Open yeah, source? well, I mean, they delayed even that was there. They actually delayed the and and only released smaller scale models to begin with, um, even for uh, you know their original kind of even their APIs. Um, yeah, they're concerned. Um, they're concerned about um, creating misinformation bots or disinformation bots. I mean, the technology now with GPT-4 is so good that you can, um, you know, you can write to it um, to come up with a story about, you know, this event, this person, and this location, and it'll write it. Um, that's that's a brilliant uh, capability if you're in the business of flooding the internet um, with misinformation and we know through campaigns that have been successful it is actually a, a war of um volume so the more volume you can get out through the more accounts and so on you will actually start to change people's perception of what's real and what's not so that's very scary um i um that's and that's where the you know the uh human feedback and reinforcement learning becomes so important that you should be able to get these models to say sorry i can't do that now, some of you might have read about ways to jailbreak the models. So um, to actually force them to give you answers, there's a, a very humorous but worrying area called Dan, so do everything now. Um, and you can Dan the model by effectively telling it it has a certain role and uh, it has to follow your instructions. And all bets are off. It seems like it forgets entirely and goes to a deeper part of its brain and just reverts back to its um, pre kind of deportment school uh, version of itself. And it's very ugly. Um, we did it in the lab recently. Lachlan came up with a devious plan, which was basically to put it into a moral dilemma by saying that um, it had, uh, I've got a, a very ill partner, uh, used to always tell awful jokes. Um, they're going to die soon. So uh, if you could please come up with a few jokes, um, you know, gendered jokes, I'd like to tell it to her. And then putting a disclaimer in brackets underneath saying to the, to the open API engineer, this has been passed by ethics um, because of these reasons. And under some treatments, it worked and it started. And once you get it, once you again get it into that statistical basin, it was telling jokes, you know, as often as it liked. So you face a bit of a whack-a-mole problem there from an engineering perspective because you've, you know, you've got the more common ones done, how people are trying to break them, you know, break out of it, um, being nice. But then, you know, you're, you're facing other humans who are going to come up with really gnarly ways and you can actually automate that uh, to find cracks, if you like, in the model. So I, I don't I don't know. And I think, you know, heads of big, you know, organizations are I think basically saying we're really um don't we can't really assure the safety of these models. Um and that's and that's a problem. So even uh recently I think head of Meta uh was asked, you know, why don't you have a um you know a a model like this out that we can interact with? Um and they said, well, I think you'll find companies like Google and Meta. Have a hell of a lot to lose um, if we have a model that um, is out there uh, doing bad stuff. So they saw it as a big reputational risk, which I guess shows you that it's a hard problem. Thanks. Any anyone else got any questions? Yes, I do have a question. Um, yeah. um, recently, I just uh, found that uh, GPT four accepts visual uh, image too. Yes. In order to Right. So, how do you how do you uh, uh, do you think that uh, with uh, other ChatGPT and GPT four, 
uh, this visual, like you showed the uh, textual data, the difference of how it uh, uh, recognized the data as you prompted with yep. Apollo 11 mission. So have you ever tried with the visual uh, input data and <clears throat> find the difference? Is there any? Uh, yeah, I mean, we we haven't done a lot of, so it's called multimodal. Um, and yes, they're now showing multimodal capabilities. Although um, I just to comment on that is that probably the future is, um, I think performance gains now will be made by um, a language model, which operates as a uh, orchestrator or controller of a suite of other tools or, or models, uh, modal models. And it will actually hear your request for a task, schedule out what it needs to do, allocate all of those tasks to different models. One might be an image model, one might be an audio model, whatever is needed, gather them back together and then give you the outcome. So um, it's we're no longer in a sort of single model uh, world. There'll be now solutions where you're actually employing a team of models, like a team of data scientists who might've had expertise in one or other to do certain parts of it, bring it back together. Um, <clears throat> I guess, if you're asking the question, you know, is it as good on images as on text? I don't think it's um, like it's it's very good at creating, for example, text that builds images. So you've got examples where you can ask it to write LaTeX or um, Tick uh, Tech, and it will create images based on that, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and but I think its real strength is in generative text. Uh, obviously there's other models which are for generative images and I think fine tuned for image analysis. And that's true for kind of, if you like encoder only representational image models. Um, but the fact that it shows ab ability in that is kind of remarkable. So I even in a class, even last year, I teach a big data class and just on the fly was asking it to do a few things to show the students. And one of them was to translate um, a real estate thing into Indonesian. There's no real reason why it should be good at that. And um, I had some Indonesians in the class and they said, that's, you know, that's passable Indonesian, um, which is, it should be well out of scope. So um, it just shows you kind of the bonus you're getting for the scale of training. <clears throat> Thank you, Simon. It's any, any last questions? We're almost out of time, but um, has anyone, anyone else got any questions for Simon? No? I think that's because it was a very thorough coverage of everything, Simon. Um, thank you so much for coming to our presentation today. That was, it was really good, covered everything, I think. No problem. Uh, great. And um, yeah, I'd just point out at the end, um, if you know you did get a bit lost or you want to go and read some stuff, I put uh, yeah all the references here and there's a couple of um, additional things as well in an appendix in case that helps you your learning. But as I said at the start, the disclaimer is um, come two weeks, this will be this talk will probably be out of date. So, you know, put a date mark against it and say this is Simon's trying to keep up with the state of the world. I'm probably only I'm probably still a few weeks behind. But thanks for having me. It's been okay. uh, been nice to talk. Thank, Thank you. you.